Hey YouTube, this is Dr. Joel. Uh, in this video, I'm going to be covering the antiarrhythmic agents. I'm going to start with a review of cardiac physiology and then jump right into the agents themselves. I'll cover the class 1, class 2, class 3, class 4, class 5, and then just give you some departing thoughts. And then I will finish off with a couple of knowledge challenge questions just to see where you're at. Okay, let's get started. In order to do a really good review of the cardiac antiarrhythmic agents, it's first important for me to cover a little bit of cardiac physiology, starting first with the cardiac action potential. And that's because this action potential is a little bit different than the action potential that you're going to see in nerves. Also, a solid understanding of this action potential will help you later understand why the drugs work the way they do. So this picture on the right represents a cardiac action potential. And one thing that you need to understand is that this action potential is going to be a little bit different depending on which part of the heart you're measuring. However, the principles that I'm about to cover will apply to all of those tissues in the heart. And if you want to, you can click on this link, which will take you to a picture that I think does a really cool job about showing the differences in the cardiac action potential in the different sections of the heart, and then also how all those electrical depolarizations add up to make the electrocardiogram waveform. Anyway, on the x-axis, we have time, and on the y-axis, we have voltage. In the polarized state, the heart rests at about negative 95 millivolts. An action potential cycle takes about 200 milliseconds. And that number changes depending on which part of the heart you're in or which tissue you're sampling. So on this graph, you can see that the heart starts at about negative 95 millivolts. Then it very quickly shoots up to about uh, 20 or so by this graph, positive 20 millivolts. It stays there for a bit, and then the cell starts to repolarize itself. And that's the cycle. I'm going to add a cell membrane at the top of this picture, and I'm going to walk through the phases of the action potential one at a time. And what I want you to do is I want you to imagine that above this cell membrane is the extracellular space, and below this membrane is the intracellular space. Okay, starting off with phase zero, which is the depolarization phase. This is caused by a opening of voltage-gated sodium channels, and these are very fast, rapid-acting uh, channels that allow a large amount of sodium to move very quickly. Sodium is positively charged, so um, if positive things come into the cell, then the cell becomes more positive. Okay, does that make sense? Basically, that's why you see this huge skyrocketing here of the voltage from negative 95 to positive 20. It's because those sodium, positive sodium ions are moving in very quickly. Next is phase one, which is the initial repolarization phase, which is basically caused by the uh, rapid inactivation of those sodium channels. Almost as quickly as they open, they start to close again. At the same time, voltage-gated potassium channels start to open, allowing potassium to efflux or exit the cell. Potassium is also positively charged. So if you have positive things leaving the cell, then the cell becomes more negative, right? And that's why there's a little dip there in the voltage. Next, with phase two, you get calcium channels, and they begin to open. Calcium, again, also positive. Positive things coming into the cell would make the cell more positive, but potassium is still moving out, so that would make the cell more negative. And hence, you get this plateau phase. It kind of balances out for a little bit. It's not exactly flat, but it's uh, close. We still call it the plateau phase. And as you know, the calcium plays an effect on how the muscle cells contract. So that's important as well for contraction. Next is the rapid repolarization phase, which is phase three. More of the voltage-gated slow potassium channels are opening, 
and they allow more potassium to rush out and the calcium channels begin to close. So the cell starts to move back down to a negative value, a strong negative value. And you have to remember the sodium potassium ATPase pump is also you know, chugging along this whole time. It's still working. It's still pumping potassium in and sodium out, which is just another factor that is driving that cell back down to its polarized state. Lastly is the fourth phase, which is the resting potential phase. Basically, the cell is at rest. It's waiting for the next action potential to hit, and that leads us back around to phase zero. So, three very important ions for the cardiac action potential. Each of these ions plays an important part in how the electricity, the action potential, or the wave of depolarization moves through the heart, how quickly it moves, how fast it reacts, how quickly it resets itself. And we're going to talk about drugs that affect sodium channels, potassium channels, and calcium channels. So you can see why understanding the physiology helps the drugs to make more sense. Awesome, let's move on. The next important physiology topic are the voltage-gated sodium channels. These are important for us to understand because various drugs will affect this sodium channel when it's in different states, okay? So we need to understand it. A couple of unique properties of the voltage-gated sodium channels. First of all, it is voltage-gated. That means that it opens and closes in response to different membrane voltage potentials. Not necessarily to a receptor or a chemical change, but to a voltage change. The next important thing are these states. The first state is the deactivated state, the second is the activated, and the third is the inactivated. And right away you might be wondering, you know, deactivated sounds a lot like inactivated. It's kind of strange. And it's true, conversationally, we do use those words kind of interchangeably, but they do mean different things when we're talking about these sodium channels. So let's start with the first state, the deactivated state. In the deactivated state, the, and you have to keep these straight in your head, the activation gate is closed, and that's depicted here by the narrowing in the channel itself. However, the inactivation gate is open. The inactivation gate works differently than the activation gate. The inactivation gate is kind of like a plug on a string or a plug that you might use in a bathtub. So in the deactivated state, the activation gate is closed and the inactivation gate is open. The channel as a whole is closed and if we look down at our graph at the bottom, this represents phase four in the cardiac action potential. It's in a resting state. It's waiting. There are a lot of sodium ions that are waiting to influx and cause that rapid depolarization. In the activated state, which corresponds to phase zero in the cardiac action potential, the activation gates open and there's a large influx, a very fast influx of sodium into the cell, which causes the depolarization. Once the maximum voltage is reached, we get to our next state, which is the inactivated state, where the inactivation gate closes, something like this. Again, sodium ions cannot get through because the gate as a whole is closed. And that little pendulum gate at the bottom, which is the inactivation gate, cannot be reopened until the membrane repolarizes. So as you can see from our graph below, this represents phases 1, 2, and 3 in the cardiac action potential. And this also represents the effective refractory period. Because that little gate will not reopen until the cell is repolarized and the voltage-gated channel as a whole resets itself, no amount of electrical stimulation will cause another action potential. I mean, that's the basic definition of what an effective refractory period is. Then, once the cell repolarizes, once we get back to phase four, the voltage-gated sodium channel resets itself back to the deactivated state wherein the activation gate is closed 
and the inactivation gate is open. And now we're ready for another action potential and another surge of sodium ions into the cell. And now for a few words on refractory periods and arrhythmias. The picture on the right represents a Purkinje fiber branch, where it, br where it branches into more than one pathway. In this example, the action potential starts at the top of the picture and moves down. So what does this little hollow area represent? It could be anything really. It could be a blood vessel. It could be previous scar tissue. It could be just a normal branch point in the Purkinje fiber or many other things. So what happens is that the action potential starts at the top of the heart and begins to move very quickly down through the Purkinje fibers. And I want you to imagine the head of the arrow as the leading edge or the leading wave of depolarization and the tail of the arrow representing the refractory period or that tissue that cannot be re-stimulated because it's still resetting itself. It's refractory. So the action potential continues to move down until we get to this point. What happens where these two waves of the action potential meet? Well, nothing really because both sides are refractory. So one action potential hits the other action potential and neither one of the two can go any further because the tissue behind both is refractory. Well, that works fine in normal cardiac tissue, but what if we have an area of ischemia or an area of damage, an area that causes essentially a one-way directional tissue? So this example now on the right has a little area of ischemia or damage. And that tissue will only allow an action potential to move through it in one direction. Okay, so again, the action potential starts at the top and it moves down through the tissue. You can see that the action potential is stopped at this one-way point on the left branch of the Purkinje fibers. But on the right branch of the Purkinje fibers, it continues. Now look at this. At this point, the action potential has reached the other side of the one-way uh, the electrical valve, if you will. And so the action potential can go through that tissue. It might go through a little bit slower, but it can penetrate in this direction. Uh-oh, you see the problem here? By the time the action potential gets through the ischemic tissue, it has reached Purkinje fibers that are in phase four, Purkinje fibers that are ready to fire again. And what you get is a loop. It continues to fire and fire and fire and fire very rapidly. This can cause a tachyarrhythmia. Does that make sense? So now, what if we take this same example of the ischemic tissue and the Purkinje fibers, but we change the refractory period by adding a drug? Well, the same thing happens to begin with. The action potential begins, comes down through the Purkinje fibers. You can see now, however, that the refractory period is longer. The previous tissue still is not yet um, reset. It's still refractory, and the action potential continues down. It splits at the next branch point until it hits that point where it can try to come back up through the one-way ischemic tissue. However, you can see the tissue on the other side is not yet past its refractory period. So it cannot continue in that loop that we saw before. We've essentially squashed or killed the arrhythmia by lengthening the refractory period. Okay?
So now that we've discussed the refractory periods and arrhythmias, is it a little bit easier to see how if drugs change the action potential and the refractory period, then we can change or even improve arrhythmias? And that's what we're going to start talking about next, with starting first with the class 1 antiarrhythmics, which are sodium channel blockers. Now let's talk about the class 1A agents. I'm using a slightly different picture now to represent the graph of the action potential, but the concepts are all the same. And this picture in black represents a standard cardiac action potential that has no drug effect. The class 1A agents change the shape of the action potential to something like this. They work by blocking sodium channels. Remember those fast-acting sodium channels that cause a very fast depolarization at phase zero? Well, you can imagine that if those were blocked slightly or inhibited slightly, it would decrease the rate and the rise of this action potential. Also, even though we're talking about class 1 agents, which are sodium channel blockers, class 1A agents have a little bit of potassium channel action. And that prolongs phase two because it decreases the speed that the cell can repolarize. And this extends the duration of the action potential or increases the effective refractory period. Class 1A agents are typically used for things like ventricular tachyarrhythmias, paroxysmal recurrent atrial fibrillation, and Wolf-Parkinson-White syndrome, for which you would use procanamide. And lastly, the three most common examples of the class 1A agents are disapyramide, quinidine, and procanamide. All right, now the class 1B agents. The class 1B agents actually cause a little bit of the shortening of the action potential, and so they change the shape of the curve to look something like this. Their mechanism of action is of course related to the sodium channels, because we're still talking about class 1 agents. However, they don't block phase 0 as much as the class 1A agents. Also, they have no effect on the potassium channels, but instead decrease the residual sodium plateau influx, which essentially helps the cell to repolarize and decreases the length of phase two on our curve. Class 1B antiarrhythmics are used for ventricular arrhythmias or tachyarrhythmias. They have no use for atrial tachyarrhythmias. The three most common examples of the class 1B antiarrhythmics are maxillotine, lidocaine, and phenytoin. The class 1C antiarrhythmic agents have the largest effect on phase zero without a significant shift of the action potential. Their mechanism of action is related to a strong block of the sodium channels, which again causes this large decrease of the rate and rise of the action potential. They are used for paroxysmal atrial fibrillation, and the best three examples for this class, flecainide, moricicine, and propafenone. So right about now, you're probably thinking, how in the heck am I going to remember all that? Well, there's a couple things that might help you. So first of all, when you're thinking about the graph of the action potential of each of these subclasses of the sodium channel blockers, I wouldn't organize it in my brain as 1A, 1B, and 1C. I would actually remember it as B, A, C. And that's just because that's the order that the graphs uh, descend away from the normal cardiac action potential. Next, for remembering all the drug names, there's a pretty cool mnemonic that pretty much everybody uses, and that is what I like for lunch.
a double quarter pounder. So the class 1A DQP double quarter pounder, disapyramide, quinidine, and procanamide. What do you want on it? Mayo, lettuce, and pickles? Maxillotine, lidocaine, and phenytoin? And more fries, please. Maricicine, flecainide, and propafenone. All right, I hope that helps. Okay, now to cover the class two antiarrhythmics. These are also known as beta blockers, and beta blockade in the heart is mostly talking about beta one blockade because beta-1 is definitely very important to the way that the heart senses an increase in sympathetic tone. So essentially, by blocking beta-1 receptors, we are decreasing the sympathetic tone to the heart. This decreases the conduction speed through the AV node. Also, this would decrease the automaticity of irritable cardiac tissue. So really quick, let's show what's happening. The red dot is the SA node. The green dot is the AV node. The SA node fires, which sends an electrical signal through the atrium to the AV node. The AV node slows that electrical impulse down just a little bit to give the atria time to contract and give the ventricles a preload kick. Then that same electrical impulse finally gets through the AV node and it's passed on through the bundle of Hiss and the Purkinje fibers to the ventricles so that they can contract. Well, what would happen if that right atrium was very irritable? What if there were a lot of ectopic pacemakers firing off in an uncoordinated and unrhythmic manner? And furthermore, what if that AV node had a very short refractory period? Kind of like what happens normally when that tissue is stimulated by sympathetic nervous system. Well, the AV node would try to transmit as many of those atrial depolarization waves as it could, which would result in a tachyarrhythmia. Beta blockers would act here at the AV node to decrease the conduction or increase the effective refractory period. Also, beta blockade would decrease the number of ectopic pacemakers. So let's subtract a few of those. So now this is what we're looking at. Okay? So that leads us right into our uses. Beta blockers are great for decreasing tachyarrhythmias, especially supraventricular tachyarrhythmias. Also, beta blockers have been clinically proven to decrease the mortality after an MI. As for examples, here's a very short list of some beta blockers. And a good way to remember beta blockers is that they usually end in OL, OL. However, look at carvedilol. Carvedilol does not end in OL, OL. It ends in IL, OL. It's a little bit different and has some unique properties. Do you remember what those unique properties are? Well, in addition to being a non-selective beta blocker, carvedilol also blocks the alpha-1 receptor. All right, let's move on. Class 3 antiarrhythmics. These are the potassium channel blockers. And because they block the potassium channel, they increase the duration of the action potential, thus causing an elongation of the effective refractory period, as we've previously discussed. Comparing class three agents, or these potassium channel blockers, to the class one agents, which are the sodium channel blockers, it has been shown that there is less of an effect with the class three agents on ischemic tissue than with class 1 agents. Class 3 antiarrhythmics are used for um, syndromes such as Wolf-Parkinson-White syndrome, ventricular tachycardias, and atrial tachycardias or tachyarrhythmias. Some examples include amiodarone, bertillium, dronetarone, ibutilide, and sotilol. 
A few important things to point out amongst those drugs are amiodarone and sotalol have additional antiarrhythmic properties than just potassium channel blocking. So amiodarone, for example, is a great antiarrhythmic. It's used very often. It's used in uh, ACLS protocol. It has class 1, 2, 3, and 4 activity. It's a good drug. You need to know that drug. High yield, high, high yield for your tests. Sotalol, in addition to being a potassium channel blocker, also has beta blocking activity. And you can remember that because it ends in ALOL, which is close to the OLOL of beta blockers. And lastly, how do you remember that short list of drugs? Most people remember it by thinking, a big dog is scary. Okay? Okay, now on to the class 4 antiarrhythmics, which are the calcium channel blockers. The mechanism of action for the antiarrhythmic properties of calcium channel blockers are that they block L-type calcium channels, which decrease the conduction through the AV node and also increase the effective refractory period of the AV node. And we've talked already about how those two mechanisms um, cause an abatement or a decrease in the arrhythmia. Another cool thing about the calcium channel blockers, uh, if you think about it, is that this mechanism of action sounds a lot like the mechanism of the beta blockers or the class 2 drugs. And that's kind of true. Um, however, the nice thing about using the calcium channel blockers versus the beta blockers is that we free up or uh, don't bog down the adrenergic system. Thus, we can get the effect that we want without necessarily having to block um, the heart's ability to respond to adrenergic stimulation. Uses for these calcium channel blockers are first to prevent the recurrence of paroxysmal supraventricular tachycardias. Not to stop an acute tachycardia, but to prevent a recurrence. So they're used more for long-term maintenance. Also, they reduce ventricular rate in patients with atrial fibrillation. The two examples of the calcium channel blockers that are used for their antiarrhythmic properties are both non-dihydropyridine calcium channel blockers, verapamil and diltiazem. And both of those are very commonly used, so they are high yield. So try to keep those in mind. All right, let's move on. Now into the class five antiarrhythmics. These are a group of uh, unrelated drugs that all have some kind of antiarrhythmic property. They don't fit nicely into the other four categories that were originally defined in this classification system, the Von Williams classification system. They are useful as antiarrhythmics. We do use them, so we just made a fifth class to put them in. And there are several of these drugs. I'm going to cover three of them, digoxin, adenosine, and magnesium. First up is going to be digoxin, which is a high-yield drug. You really have to know this drug, so I'm going to go into a little bit of detail on the mechanism of action. All right, so here's the cell membrane again with the extracellular space on top and the intracellular space on the bottom. Digoxin works by inhibiting the sodium-potassium ATPase or the sodium-potassium pump. And we know that this pump works by using ATP to push out three ions of sodium for every two ions of potassium that it brings in. Normally that would mean that the extracellular concentration of sodium would increase while the intracellular concentration would decrease. The cell can then use that higher concentration or that gradient of sodium on the extracellular side to provide energy to do other kinds of work. And one of those other kinds of work is to power the sodium calcium exchanger, which is a membrane protein that the cell uses to get calcium back out of the cell. And it does that by exchanging three ions of sodium, each one with a positive one charge, for 
one ion of calcium, which has a positive two charge. Okay, so does that make sense? That's what's supposed to happen without any inhibition or drugs. Digoxin, like I said, inhibits that sodium potassium ATPase or that pump, which means sodium isn't pumped out as well or as efficiently, which in turn means that calcium is not pumped out as well or as efficiently. So you get an increased intracellular concentration of calcium. And I've mentioned already that calcium is one of the important ions in the cardiac action potential and in maintaining the rhythm of the heart. I also mentioned that calcium plays a part in how the muscles contract, or in this case, the heart muscle contracts. So, digoxin plays a big part in changing the entropy of the heart, but it also changes refractory periods. So when digoxin is used as an antiarrhythmic, it's mostly used in cases of AFib or a flutter with rapid ventricular response. We also sometimes use digoxin um, for heart failure patients, taking advantage of the inotropic effects. Okay? The second class 5 antiarrhythmic on my list is adenosine. Adenosine is a pretty cool drug if you've ever seen it work in the clinic. It works on adenosine receptors and these are G protein coupled receptors which I've highlighted in red because that's an important topic and if you're not very familiar with those you should brush up on those if you're preparing for your board exams. The ultimate effect is going to be cell hyperpolarization leading to a transient very short term heart block in the AV node. And like I said, it's pretty cool to watch because the patients feel it. Their heart stops for a brief second or two. And in all the cases that I've seen, at least, the heart starts back up again, but then it starts back up again in a normal sinus rhythm instead of a tachyarrhythmia. Because of its effect on the AV node, adenosine is used for supraventricular tachycardias or tachyarrhythmias. So that would be like AV reentrant tachycardia or AV nodal reentrant tachycardia. And then on to our last class 5 antiarrhythmic, which is just magnesium. Magnesium is important and high yield for your boards only for really two things that I can think of that I know of. And that is uh, eclampsia and preeclampsia, which you can lump together. And then torsades, which is another high yield topic that you should probably look into. It's basically a very specific waveform on an EKG that can uh, signify an impending um, possible cardiac disaster, w which even could lead to sudden cardiac death. It doesn't happen really all that often in the real world, but it's definitely a board favorite. Torsade de point is a French word meaning uh, twisting of the points or twisting of the spikes. And that's just because um, the, you can see this waveform here looks like it's twisting back and forth like a ribbon. All right, good job for hanging in there through this long lecture. We've covered the class one, two, three, four, and five antiarrhythmics. And you're probably wondering, Dr. Joel, can you please give me something to help me to remember all these antiarrhythmics? And the answer is, well, yes, I can. How about you think of it as some block potassium channels? And that's for, you know, the class 1, 2, 3, and 4 for sodium channel blockers, beta blockers, potassium channel blockers, and calcium channel blockers. Some block potassium channels. All right. Also, another departing thought. If you really want to impress your preceptor, you could know a little bit about the Cardiac Arrhythmia Suppression Trial, the CAST trial. This was done in the late 80s to late 90s and involved about 1,500 patients. Basically, it was trying to answer the question as to what to do with a patient after they have a heart attack. We know that after a patient survives a heart attack, a common cause of them uh, dying later on is from a lethal arrhythmia. And part of the reason for that, we briefly touched on when we talked about refractory periods, which is why I'm showing this image to the right. So it would make sense to try and quell those arrhythmias to prolong the patient's life. And that used to be done with class 1 antiarrhythmics. 
This study tested that theory and actually found that those drugs increased mortality instead of lowering it. Hence, nowadays, we generally try to avoid suppressing arrhythmias in patients who have had an MI with class 1 drugs. Okay? Okay, you've made it this far. Good job. Knowledge challenge number 1. To which antiarrhythmic class does propranolol belong? Propranolol is a class 2 antiarrhythmic. Remember the mnemonic some block potassium channels? So class 1 are the sodium bl channel blockers, class 2 are the beta blockers, class 3 are the potassium channel blockers, and class 4 are the calcium channel blockers, some block potassium channels. Also remember that most of the beta blockers end in OLOL, -O -L, so propranolol, or esmolol, or metoprolol, OLOL. -O -L. Okay, good job, let's move on. Knowledge challenge number two. Which antiarrhythmic class has the most effect on phase zero of the cardiac action potential? All right, it's actually class 1C. Remember how I was overlaying the um, changes in the cardiac action potential with the class 1 drugs? And I told you, instead of thinking about it as class A, B, and C, It'd probably be better to think about it as class BAC because that's how the curves kind of move away from the unaffected normal physiology, right? So class C has the strongest effect on that initial fast sodium influx. Knowledge challenge number three. On your ER rotation, you're called to help with a code blue. And as the team quickly assembles and begins ACLS, your attending physician asks you, yes, you, as the medical student, to run the code. You're, of course, very nervous, but it's a teaching hospital, and you know that the attending and the team are motivated to help you through. After a few minutes of following ACLS protocol, you ask a team member to prepare a syringe of a drug that is usually listed as a class 3 antiarrhythmic, but has properties of all four of the classes. Which drug is this? D, amiodarone. Great drug. You gotta know it. High yield. You are going to use this drug or talk about this drug in your rotations. All right, good job. Hey guys, thanks for watching this video. I really had fun making it. And I love working with students, so if you've got any questions or comments, shoot me a message and I will do my best to get back to you, okay? Also, give me a like. Those likes keep me motivated. Make sure you subscribe if you want to keep up to date on all my newest videos. Maybe check out some of the links if you've got time. If not, hang in there, keep pushing. Good luck in school. I know you can do it.